Good evening and welcome to our Thursday night presentation on supporting a healthy lifestyle. I first want to start off with prayer before we enter into the presentation. So I'm going to start with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing us all here today for this wonderful presentation by Dr. Youngberg. And please let us learn something new and just refresh on anything that we may not, that we already may know. Um, please keep us all safe and healthy through these times and these predicaments that we're in right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So you'll be hearing from Dr. Youngberg today. He'll be our presenter. And just a little brief information on him. He is an associate professor for the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health at Loma Linda University. He, is, um, he has written a book on um, Goodbye Diabetes, so a book about how to live with diabetes and just prevent diabetes and cure diabetes, as well as um, being a medical missionary in Guam and doing research in diabetes there. And he also owns his own clinic in Temecula practicing um, lifestyle medicine work. So his main overall thing is lifestyle medicine and diabetes, and you'll be hearing next from him on these topics. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Yonkert. Thank you, Casey. It's, it's great. Uh, it's great to work with you today and be on the show with you. Um, I know that you have a great interest in, in eventually working with, with uh, diabetic uh, uh, youth and children and pediatric diabetes. And so today I want to share with you, um, well, kind of a 30 years of my experience in, in helping patients reverse diabetes. I want to share with you a couple case studies that will uh, hopefully inspire those of you that may be struggling with diabetes or pre-diabetes and, and recognize that there's a good chance that you can do something about it that you don't have to just live with it uh, uh, for, for the rest of your life. One of the challenges that, that uh, many people with diabetes have is when, you know, historically when they've talked with their doctor about diabetes, uh, the doctor says, you're going to have this condition and I bet a lot of you can just finish that sentence uh, for the rest of your life. You just got to learn to manage it, et cetera. Well, that used to be the historical perspective. And just recently, as you see at the bottom of this screen, that um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which I had the privilege to be one of the founding directors of about 15 years ago, uh, is a worldwide organization now that has thousands of physicians and health professionals and are members of this, where they're learning essentially how to not just manage diabetes, but actually reverse diabetes. And so you see the title, uh, I'm using slides from a presentation that um, a group of us doctors, lifestyle medicine doctors put together is the first continuing medical education program for health professionals and, and physicians that, that teaches them on this concept of reversing diabetes, reversing type two diabetes and insulin resistance with lifestyle medicine. And so one of my jobs is, as we put together this, this 18 hour uh, continuing medical education series for, for healthcare professionals around the world was uh, helping them understand that, you know, what they learned in medical school isn't actually what the research says, you know, um, so many doctors, yes. We are not seeing your screen, so you don't have to share your screen real fast. Uh, not seeing the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so let me see. Why don't, why don't I try to share screen again then? I share. There we go. And this should work. Let's try that. Um, can you see this? Can you Perfect. see the screen now? Perfect. We're Perfect. good? Yep. All right. So now you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, you can see that they, we, we, a whole group of us doctors that specialize in lifestyle medicine wanted to share with, with the, the healthcare community that we, we don't have to be telling our patients anymore. Yeah, you're just going to have to live with this. You know, there's really no cure. Like, you know, the American Diabetes Association used to say, Oh, there's no cure for diabetes. The um, 
the uh, uh, library, the National Library of Medicine used to say, oh, the diabetes is a lifelong disease. There's, there's just essentially no cure. Uh, or at Mayo Clinic, there's no cure for type 2 diabetes. And so, you know, people believe that. And so they then try to do anything about it. Why try to reverse something if it's, if it's not reversible, right? Uh, and so now the Mayo Clinic is actually taking a lead role in helping educate doctors that there is a, uh, there's a powerful strategies available to actually help people reverse this condition. Now, the, the, for those of you that maybe for the first time are hearing that, well, this is really possible and wondering if this applies to you, uh, this, the research on this really began to take a, a significant turn back in the 70s when Dr. James Anderson, who was the chief endocrinologist at the University of, uh, of Kentucky at Lexington, he actually did research on the most brittle diabetics. And, and, and these are the diabetics that have blood sugar swings all over the place, and they're, they're on lots of insulin. And he put them he, in the hospital on a plant-based diet and was able to reverse diabetes in the majority of them. And that was even without exercise. They were just laying in the hospital bed, kind of in a metabolic ward. And this was research done in the mid-70s. And here we are going on 50 years later, and there's still a perspective out there that, well, you know, we really can't do much about it. Once you have diabetes, it's just a done deal. Just take your medicine. We'll increase your medicine as necessary. But that doesn't actually fix the underlying cause of the problem. So, yeah, you can control blood sugars better by taking more medicine, but that doesn't fix the actual pathology of the problem. So, so Dr. Anderson actually came to Loma Linda University in 1985, and I attended his workshop as a, as a student at Loma Linda University, and I became, I became passionate about what I had learned from Dr. Anderson that, indeed, diabetes could be reversed. Again, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, not type 1 diabetes here. Type 1 diabetics can improve their health dramatically by doing the same things, okay? But, but we're talking about 95% of diabetics have type 2 diabetes. That's the, Ill, that's the condition that we're referring to today. Now, um, so uh, another part of the transition, I know uh, many of you who've been around for a while remember this, this, uh, this video that came out where Morgan Spurlock, the, the, the person who, who put this, this uh, documentary together, supersized me, uh, you know, basically showed how he, he could gain 29 pounds in just a matter of weeks by eating only at McDonald's. And it was a, quite a, a revolutionary documentary where he was, he was calling on us to pay attention to what we eat because that's what causes disease. And so um, in this, in this uh, documentary, Morgan Spurlock interviews two surgeons who basically said that the only procedure that they were aware of that could reverse diabetes was bariatric surgery. And so I, uh, I'll, I'll leave it here for a second. So in, in 2004, I had been asked by a, a very large uh, uh, med medical uh, society uh, in, 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 in the Western Pacific to give a lecture on reversing diabetes with nutrition. And I said, th this was back in the day where it was kind of, it was frowned upon. It was almost considered quackery for anybody to talk about reversing diabetes. In fact, in many places, it was considered quackery. Even though there was a lot of research supporting it, politically, it just, it was a non-starter. And so, um, and so I said, I said to the president of this medical society, I said, hey, doc, you know, are you sure you want me to talk about reversing diabetes with nutrition? Because, you know, that's kind of politically charged. And he goes, oh, no, no, they'll love it. So I'll give you 90 minutes to present this. So, so it was a Sunday afternoon in early October, 2004, that I walked into a double ballroom at the Hilton at this medical society meeting. It's over 500 people, uh, doctors and nurses and health professionals in attendance. And, and, and I was feeling pretty good. And, uh, and I was listening to uh, 
a, a, a researcher from Europe finish his talk right before I was going to come on. And, and uh, he was a geneticist. And he was talking about how sometime in the future, we'd be able to reverse diabetes through genetic reengineering. I, rem I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, so I go on to give my talk. I, I, I showed them a little clip of this very documentary, Supersize Me, where Morgan Spurlock actually, actually uh, uh, interviews these, these bariatric surgeons that they could reverse diabetes. Now, the reason I showed that is because I wanted to establish from their own group that that there is a that there was a growing number of researchers that were saying diabetes was reversible even if it was just having you know uh, a stomach stapling surgery or bariatric surgery um, and so and so uh, I, I went on to explain how I believe was the best way through nutritional intervention to reverse diabetes and lifestyle medicine. Well, at the end of my talk the chairman of the scientific committee for this big conference stood up and, uh, and I knew who he was. He was, he was a nephrologist that actually worked in the same building where we had our lifestyle medicine clinic. Uh, he had a dialysis clinic in the same building and he stood up and he said, I want to go on record as saying that I totally disagree with Dr. Youngberg's assertion that you can reverse diabetes. You could have heard a pin drop. So, so, I mean, so, so my entire presentation is being challenged by the chairman of the scientific committee. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, you know, I could tell he wasn't, he wasn't getting down on me in particular. He just felt, he felt, he was stressed. He felt compelled that he had to say something because he felt that there was going to be a backlash against him for allowing this presentation. So he, he went on record as being against the idea. And so I'm, I'm praying, you know, I'm, I've been, I'm, you know, I'm at the podium, you know, I'm still there, you know, uh, getting ready to take questions, uh, which we're happy to take from you, this audience as well. And uh, I'm praying, says, Lord, help me to respond nicely <laughs> to this, to this challenge, you know, because it's a professional challenge. Um, and uh, help me to know how to do it in a way that does not, does not uh, burn any bridges, but that actually is, is healing. And so uh, he went on to explain himself, thankfully, and gave me a little bit of time to think. And, um, and he, he said, well, you know, just like our last presenter, someday we believe that we'll be able to reverse diabetes through genetic reengineering. Okay, but not now. And when I heard him say that, it reminded me, that's exactly, I'm going to address that. So, so uh, my, my response, everybody's looking, 500 Doctors and nurses are looking at me like, how's he going to respond to this? Are we going to have a fight on stage? You know, uh, uh, is this going to become hostile? And, and I, I, first thing I say this is, doctor, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you raised a, uh, uh, this concern that many people maybe have because I learned this the same thing in school myself, that you couldn't reverse it. Yeah, at least until Dr. Anderson changed my understanding of it while I was a student. And um, so I, I explained, thank you for raising that issue. He says, but we got to be really careful when we say to our patients that diabetes is not reversible. Because if we're wrong, we have just destroyed the last opportunity potentially for that individual to, to uh, have a sense that he can or she can uh, uh, do something about this and through their choices actually reverse that process. And, and then I said, the second thing that's really critical, so glad that we have a eminent uh, presenter from Europe talking about how diabetes could in the future be reversed through genetic engineering, because that's exactly how we use nutrition to epigenetically transform genetic risk and literally reverse diabetes that way. And so, so of course, I'd already given my presentation. People already understood where, I, where, where my perspectives were. And, and, and fortunately, he, he didn't rebuttal that. He, 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 he just sat down and uh, we went on to take questions and so forth. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is, is not, not more than two days later, the Journal of the American Medical Association on October 13, 2004, 
came out with a meta-analysis systemic review on how bariatric surgery was able to completely reverse diabetes in 77% of, of the patients who had diabetes and 62% of all hypertension was reversed, 70% of all high cholesterol was reversed and even 86% of sleep apnea reversed. Now, my point here isn't to promote bariatric surgery. My point is like Dr. Dean Ornish has said many times, you got diabetes, get rid of it. You don't need bariatric surgery 99% of the time to reverse diabetes. You just need to better understand what causes it. And if we start addressing the underlying cause of diabetes or causes of diabetes, we have a really good chance to reverse it. And I'll show you more of that in a bit. Dr. Furman, a friend of mine, says, we won't be controlling your type 2 diabetes. We'll be having you become undiabetic. Dr. John McDougall, who's been around for almost 50 years now, uh, proclaiming this very concept, he said, a simple cure is possible for essentially everybody who has type 2 diabetes. Okay, these are what the, the, the world's leading lifestyle medicine specialists are saying. Now, um, I recently I've had the opportunity to work with some of my colleagues to put together what we call the 10 stages of high blood sugar. So anybody in the audience right now who has either prediabetes or diabetes, really pay attention to this. Anybody who's been checking their blood sugars and is aware of where their blood sugars are, let's take a look at this. So this, the 10 stages of incrementally higher and higher blood sugars start with an optimal range where the fasting blood sugar is 70 to 84. Yeah, that's optimal. The one hour blood sugars are no higher than 119. The two hour blood sugars after a meal, that is after the beginning of a meal are, are no higher than 99. That's optimal, okay? Uh, with, with a hemoglobin A1C that's right at five or just under 5%. That's, that's the caramelization of sugar, of glucose, two proteins in your body that make up the hemoglobin A1C test, an actual pathology test that tells us how much damage has occurred inside your body to all tissues and organ systems because of high blood sugars. So, so then we, we, we see that stage three high blood sugar is the beginning of prediabetes. The fasting blood sugar of 100 or a little more, uh, while well, a two hour blood sugar is 140 or a little more. And then stage five is the beginning of diabetes. And then you have five stages above that of incrementally poorly, less, less effectively controlled blood sugars. So, so anyways, you, you can decide based on the fasting pre-meal blood sugar or a one or two hour blood sugar or a hemoglobin A1C where your blood, where, where your, what your stage of high blood sugar is. And these stages are important because you know, if you're at if you're at stage ten, critically uh, elevated diabetes, okay, uh, then what you want to do is you're going to feel good if you can get it down to stage seven, right? Just advanced diabetes, okay, and then you're going to feel even better if you can get it down to just kind of uh, uh, early diabetes, right? And then and then we keep going from there. And here's the good news: most people can do that. Most people can can get all this all the way under stage three pre-diabetic so that even a, a hardcore diabetic can eventually get to the point many times where they don't even have pre-diabetes anymore. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so uh, uh, some time ago, the, the diabetes, American Diabetes Association okay, uh, was tasked with the challenge of how do we define a cure of diabetes? Prior to 2009, there was no consensus and no way for a doctor, once they had diagnosed you with diabetes, to say that you didn't have diabetes anymore. In fact, th th this was so critical that, that you, know, you, 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 you could have perfect blood sugars in a perfect hemoglobin A1C that was as good as any college students, and they would still say you have diabetes because you were previously diagnosed with it which is kind of ridiculous. That's like saying to somebody who, who weighs 300 pounds and they should weigh 140 pounds, okay, to say uh, once they lost all that weight, says, well, sorry, 
you know, because you were once obese, you're still obese. You know, so it was the most ridiculous thing that there was no vehicle for the medical community to actually confirm that you didn't have diabetes anymore, even though it would seem obvious. You know, if you don't meet the criteria, you know, you, you've reversed your diabetes. That, that would be the obvious approach to it. Anyway, so they finally in 2009, after, after decades and decades of discussing this, they finally came up with the criteria. And the bottom line is that you can have complete remission if you have at least one year of normal blood sugars. In other words, your blood sugars don't meet the definition of diabetes anymore, that, that you now have complete remission. So, so in other words, uh, if you have diabetes or if you have prediabetes, okay, you can get to the point where you can say officially that you don't have that anymore if you, if you work on this hard enough so that for a year's time, you no longer meet that, uh, that criteria. Now, I, I always say to my patients, and whenever I give lectures like this uh, for the general public, that unless you and I choose to be the chairman or the chairwoman of our own healthcare board, we're not going to succeed. In other words, gone are the days when we think, well, I'm just going to let my doctor make all the decisions about my health. Okay, I'm going to let somebody else make a decision about my health. And if they say I can't do it, then I can't do it. Okay, so, so basically you have to believe that it's possible based on the evidence, right? The evidence is there. You just have to accept and review that evidence and say, okay, I'm going to take charge of my own health and, and I'm going to seek to reverse this. So let me, let me tell you a story. Okay, so this is one of the two main case studies I want to share with you this evening. Um, uh, some of you will know who this is. This is uh, Tom Zapara. And, and his daughter, uh, who, you know, I, I was just at, a, at Loma Linda University a couple years back uh, when my daughter was playing in a basketball tournament. And, uh, and so I, 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 was, I hadn't, eaten, hadn't eaten lunch, so I said, I'm going to run to Loma Linda Market and get a really healthy meal. And that's what I did. And, and I run into Tom Zapara. Now, Tom Zapara is a, a philanthropist who has donated many millions of dollars to Loma Linda University, um, to the Centennial Complex that is used to train health professionals at Loma Linda, to La Sierra University, uh, to he, he basically paid for the new school of business, uh, the Zapara building. And, and so he's done a lot of great work in, in our region uh, for, for both healthcare and, and, and education. Well, Tom happened to be the chairman of the board of, the, of a publishing house called Heart, Heart Publications. And he had a, a very close friend that had out of control diabetes. And so he wanted to have a definitive book written on reversing diabetes and in treating diabetes from a natural medicine perspective or a lifestyle medicine perspective. And so he got on the, his publisher's case, who then got on my case to write this book. It took us five years. But we finally wrote this book. Tom Zapara got the first copy of this book. It's basically a, 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 a comprehensive approach to getting rid of diabetes and prediabetes and actually uh, uh, getting rid of the underlying drivers of diabetes, which is insulin resistance. Well, so also for preventing it in the first place. So um, he got the first copy uh, uh, and, and he read the book. And as he read the book, he became convinced that he should get checked out himself. This wasn't just for his friend, man. So he called me up and he said, Wes, I need to get, I need to get checked out. I want to do all these blood tests that you talk about in your book. So we did, we did a four hour glucose tolerance test on him. So we, we went to the lab and uh, they checked all his blood, uh, blood labs. And then they gave him a sweet drink at the lab, 300 calories of glucose, like a medium soda. He drank that. And this is what, this is what we found. This was in 2013. Okay. And so Tom was, was, uh, almost 90 years old. He was, he was about, about, uh, well, about 60 pounds overweight at 220. 
Uh, his fasting blood sugar, 135. He already had diabetes just based on his fasting blood sugar. Anything above 126 is, diab is diabetic. Um, and then, so when we did the glucose tolerance test, his blood sugar was 144 fasting. His one-hour blood sugar was 261. His two-hour blood sugar was 303. And, and at three hours, it still was almost 300. And at four hours, it only dropped a little bit to 229. Tom had out of control type 2 diabetes, out of control. And, and I remember he, he and his wife drove down from Laguna Beach, where they live, to Temecula, California, where my clinic is. And, and he came into uh, to my conference room. And, 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 and he, he looked at me and says, now, Wes, I, don't, I want you to give it to me straight. I don't want you to, I, I, I don't want you to, 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 you know, to treat me with any special uh, care here. I just want you to tell me exactly what I need to do. And, 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 and so I, I said, Tom, I'm telling you, you have out of control diabetes. And, and so he literally slammed his fist uh, on the table uh, where we were talking at the, in the boardroom. And he says, all right, give it to me straight. And so, so I said, I'm doing that. So I shared with him a couple tips I'm going to share with you right now because you're going to see a transformation take place in a matter of weeks that most people think would take would never occur. He, again, he's almost 90 years old, about six weeks before his 90th birthday. And, I, and I'm telling him, Tom, you have out-of-control diabetes. A lot of doctors would say, just leave the guy alone. He's 90 years old, right? Don't bother him about his diabetes. Uh, you know, it's, it's too old to change. Well, that wasn't Tom's perspective. And so I, I shared with him a couple concepts. We shared, shared with him uh, some ideas about, about optimizing his diet. Okay, he, he basically ate whenever he was hungry. Okay, and I said, okay, Tom, let's set it up so that you're eating three meals a day, at least five hours of no food in between each meal, that you're eating basically a plant-based diet. We'll go over that in more detail. And, and, and don't eat late at night. Just, just, just eat three meals a day. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to go to two meals a day. He says, I'm 90 years old. I don't need, need to eat three meals a day. I said, okay, that's fine. We can go with two meals a day. Let's, let's try it. Uh, and so he, he did that. Okay? And he still ate, ate, to his desire, ate, ate a, two really good meals a day. And I said, all right, here's the other trick, Tom. And this is very important for our listening audience right now today. He said, I encouraged him to go walking after he eats, just do some activity. And, and, and his wife glared at me when I said that. And she said, says, Doc, do you, do, did you see him walk into this office? He can hardly walk a straight line, you know, with his neurologic issues. He's 90 years old and, and he can't go walking. And so I said, I said to, to, to her, I says, well, Vi says, you can go walking with him and hold his hand. And so she kind of scowled at me. But you know what? She thought that was a great idea. And so the next day, they, they have a, a 1.8 mile, uh, basically, uh, a road around their gated community up above Laguna, Laguna Beach. And, and so they decided, I'm going to go walking. So they held hands and they went walking around this, the, the, their, their uh, gated community. And... Uh, and so they, they became the talk of the town. Everybody could see Tom and Vi Zapara walking every morning after breakfast. It took him about 45 minutes. I didn't say he had to walk that long. Yeah, that's what he decided to do. But you see how high these blood sugars are? The blood sugars were crazy high. And, uh, and, and they remained high for four hours after eating. And so... And so there was, there was no way that he was going to be able to reverse his diabetes unless he addressed the cause of the problem. So uh, I kid you not. So this, this was in, in, in May. Uh, this was in May of 2013. Five weeks later, he calls me up, says, I'm going to be 90 years old in one week. I want to get retested now. I said, so it's only been five weeks, Tom. And he says, I know, but I want to get retested. Look what happened to his fasting blood sugars. It went from 144 to 107. He had in five weeks time already reversed 
his diabetes. Now, he still technically had pre-diabetes at this point. Okay, his hemoglobin A1C, that, that pathological measure of, of uh, caramelization of proteins to glucose had been at 7.1, dropped to 6.2 in that short amount of time. Okay, and, and basically uh, six weeks time here, it dropped. Uh, it dropped by uh, almost a whole point, which is unheard of. And he was taking no medicine at all. Uh, he was just walking after breakfast and changed his and, and changed his diet schedule to to be more consistent with what his needs were and not eating at night. So so he did that. So he already reversed his diabetes on on the hemoglobin A one C scale as well. And so so he was excited about that. He was able to report at his 90th birthday party that he had. Just been diagnosed with diabetes, and now he's already reversed it. All right. Okay. So never let somebody tell you. He says, "Well, you know, you're uh, what? You're over 55, or you're over 65? Ah, uh, you know, you you can't change. You can't you can't improve your health. You're too old. That's just simply not true. Anybody can improve their health at any any age. And so, well, a couple months go by. We check him again. If you look at the at the hemoglobin A1C, he has now crossed under the pre-diabetic cutoff. It went back up just to into the di- uh, pre-diabetic cutoff three months later. But then you you will see that in August of the following year, he no longer had pre-diabetes. And, and then and then and then ever since then, his average hemoglobin A1C, which is the main measure that we use to diagnose diabetes, was not only reversing diabetes, but he had completely reversed pre-diabetes. A hemoglobin A1C of 5.1 is perfect. It's not just better, it's perfect. Okay. And now this this was this was over seven years ago. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact it's going on eight years now, right? And I just talked to him recently and guess what his hemoglobin A1C is? 5.1%. Okay. So if a 90, 98 year old can, can maintain uh, a reversal of type two diabetes and also a reversal of pre-diabetes, okay. By, by basic strategies, what about you and I, uh, what about what, what, what do you think we should be able to accomplish? And so he was able to go from uh, a, a condition that really had had uh, advanced diabetes, stage six, high blood sugars, to a situation where he was always under stage three. He did not have prediabetes anymore. Okay, so that's that's Tom Zapara, and and you know if you if you're ever in the Laguna Beach community, you could probably still see him walking after breakfast. Why? Because he knows as he continues to do that, he'll be more functional. Okay, and so he's more functional physically now, okay, at 98 than he was than he was when he was in his 80s, uh, and that's a testament to the choices that he made based on the health risk assessment that we did. So make sure you get yourself uh, checked uh, checked out. Okay, so now, so w- one of the key things to understand here is that that what, what, what Tom had was a significant form of, of insulin resistance. And he also had a pancreas that had, at least temporarily, over time, lost its ability to produce an adequate amount of insulin. And by changing his lifestyle, uh, eating the right diet and getting on a good exercise program and paying attention to, to other factors, he was able to reverse the underlying cause of the problem. And so when, um, when we talk about, about the underlying causes of diabetes, you can see this uh, in, in this picture of an iceberg where all you see is the tip of the iceberg. Diabetes is just the tip of the iceberg. Diabetes isn't the main problem. The main problem is this huge amount of metabolic risk that lies underneath that's driving the diabetes. So if all we do is you try to try to medicate our high blood sugars, we're not doing anything to the underlying underlying cause of the diabetes. This underlying cause is insulin resistance, this 
that, that this metabolic problem that is the, one of the main drivers of heart attacks, the main driver of strokes, the main driver of, of common cancers, the main driver of dementia, which we'll talk about in, in, the, in the near future on how we can even reverse aspects of dementia as well. And so, and so it's important to note if the, we address the underlying dri uh, metabolic drivers, then we're able to most of the time fix the tip of the iceberg, which is the high blood sugar levels. Okay, now um, I, what, I, what I suggested here is that there's two main problems with the average diabetic and pre-diabetic. One is that, that there's uh, the underlying insulin resistance, that the, the, the muscle cells and the pank and the liver uh, is, is uh, less sensitive to the effect of insulin, and so blood sugars run high. That can be fixed in almost everybody fairly easily if we're willing to be on a consistent program of appropriate exercise and appropriate diet. Okay, so, but the other aspect of this, like Tom had, was the inability to, to effectively produce insulin at a, at a necessary level. And so as we, as, uh, as we have problems with insulin resistance, the pancreas has to work harder, okay? It's forced to overwork. That's this, this first stage of pancreatic burnout, where the pancreas is, is having to make more and more insulin all the time to try to combat the, the muscle and, pan, and liver re, uh, resistance to insulin. And so, and so when the pancreas is all working, you know, all the time, all day long, uh, late into the night, Eventually, it just says, "Time out. I can't do this anymore. I can't. I can't. I can't produce more insulin. I'm. I'm tired." And so, what we've learned is that even before we get diagnosed with pre-diabetes, we've already, at least temporarily, lost over sixty percent of the ability to produce insulin in our pancreas. So that's why the last thing you want to do is wait too long to get diagnosed. I believe that about 90% of people with prediabetes don't even know it. They've never been properly evaluated. And, and, uh, and they're, they're, they need to have a glucose tolerance test with a one in a two hour blood sugar after a sugar drink to establish, oh, there's a real problem here because many people have great fasting blood sugar, but, but their blood sugars one in two hours after a sugar drink go sky high and the insulin can be measured too. The ability of the pancreas to produce insulin can be measured during a glucose tolerance test at the fasting test, at the one hour blood sugar test, and at the two hour blood sugar test. That's a test that I believe everybody should get done. Anybody, anybody over age 18, any adult should get that test done because most people already have insulin resistance even in their teenage years. All right, so, so, we need to actually start healing the pancreas, giving the pancreas a break. If you remove the insulin resistance, the pancreas can kind of uh, get, get a, second, uh, a second wind. It can start healing because it's not having to overwork anymore. And then you give it the right foods, the right nutrients, a lot of, a lot of green leafy vegetables and colorful non-starchy vegetables and, and colorful fruits, et cetera. That begins to heal the pancreas. You remove the junk food. You remove the toxins in your lifestyle that you're exposed to that are damaging the, prank, uh, the, the pancreas. You, you improve your immune system to, to protect yourself against, against um, infections that really mess up uh, the pancreas and greatly increase your risk for diabetes. We've been through a, a COVID-19 pandemic. Fortunately, it's it's, it's on the way out. You know, you know the, the, there were so many people have natural immunity now because they've already been exposed to the virus and, and, and other people have, have other forms of immunity that, that really, you know, we've, we've essentially won the battle on that for now, okay, as long as we keep a strong immune system. So the COVID pandemic has created a huge new risk for diabetes. Okay, that when, when you get COVID, your diabetes risk goes through the roof. Your, the infection itself actually causes diabetes, new cases in many individuals. So we need to get tested for this and properly treated for this. Now, 
the, the, the second case study that I want to share with you before we start taking questions and, 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 uh, and addressing your interests and concerns is, is a case study of a 53 year old male who actually did a, a docu-series called I Thrive. Many of you maybe have heard of it. Uh, John McMahon is his name. And of course I have, for, I have written permission to use their case studies because well, it's just amazing case studies. And, and, and the, the reason I'm showing this, uh, this sandal with that, that, that ha that's all bloody around the toes is because, because uh, uh, John, John, and I'll show you a picture of him in a little bit. John, as a, as a, you know, in his early 50s, was weighed over 300 pounds. He knew he had diabetes, but you know what? He just, he had kind of bought into the, the, the uh, perspective, the historical perspective that, you know, once a diabetic, always a diabetic. And so he was kind of depressed over that and he just ignored it. And he, 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 he noted that, that he was, his feet were starting to get numb, but then after a while he didn't feel any more pain. You know why? Because his, his feet had basically, the nerves in his feet were basically no longer working. Well, one, one evening he goes, he lives in Pismo Beach. He goes to the beach and, and he's hanging, which is just a short walk from his home. And he's hanging out at a fire pit, just, just enjoying, you know, listening to the waves crashing, watching the, the, the waves crashing in and, and just hanging, watching the fire. And he's just having a good time and um, doesn't realize it, but he's actually barbecuing his feet. Doesn't feel a thing. Uh, he ends up, you know, spent some time at, at that fire pit. Then he walks home and, um, and he walks into his house and, and he, he walks down the hallway and around through the kitchen. And then as he comes back to the hallway again, he sees all kinds of blood on the hallway. And his first thought was, oh my goodness, what happened? Is there is, is, is there uh, somebody that got stabbed that's in my house? And, and so he's looking around and he, he follows it around and he go, he's going around in circles and he realized and he looks down at his feet, the blood is coming from his own feet that he can't even feel. And that's the actual pictures of his thongs that, that were crusted in, in blood and sand. Uh, and so he, he realized that evening that he had a real problem. Well, well, John McMahon, he, uh, he decides he's going to do a docu-series on, on diabetes. And so he, he goes to the Plantrician Project in, in Anaheim. And I actually get a call from him. Uh, I'm, at, I'm at my office in Temecula. And he says, hey, I'm interviewing doctors from all over the world on reversal of diabetes. And while I was interviewing some of them, they said, hey, you got you to gotta interview uh, Dr. Youngberg, uh, but you weren't at the conference. And so he, he says, I'm just an hour away. Can I come interview? Well, I had patients all day. I said, tell you what, uh, I'm done with patients by about 530. Uh, come, come a little bit after that, and we can go as long as you want. So literally, uh, John McMahon, let me show you a picture of his. Okay, this, this is John here. Uh, after he reversed his diabetes, by the way, um, John McMahon comes in my office and he's wearing a boot because because of his, you know, barbecuing his feet. Uh, and he's so messed up. He weighs over 300 pounds and, and he brings in all his videotaping equipment into my office and uh, and he starts interviewing me. And and we're 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 just talking and talking. We ended up talking and, and on video for three hours. Uh, you know, into the late evening because he was so excited about that maybe he too could reverse his diabetes. Well, so he learned about the, the, the labs that we did, the four-hour glucose tolerance test with the insulin values. And so he said, hey, you know what? I want to do this and I'm working with a lot of doctors that are helping me with this. Would you be in charge of doing all my tests? And I go, absolutely. So he joined our program to, to reverse his diabetes. Let me, so, so this, this is what happened. 
He before before he started the program is is that as hemoglobin A1C was seven point two. After it was four point nine. Now we're not suggesting that everybody with diabetes needs to get down to a hemoglobin A1C of four point nine. This was without any medication, by the way. Uh, we're not suggesting that somebody's got to lose ninety nine pounds to get the job done. You, the, 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 the reversal happens even before weight loss occurs in many cases. His cholesterol plummeted from 187 to 132. His triglycerides were sky high at 491, went down to 100. Uh, his CRP, a measure of inflammation, improved a little bit, still, still not enough. There was still some inflammation going on. Yeah, uh, and then, but look what happened to his blood sugars. Fasting blood sugar went from 165 to 81. No medicine. No medicine. Okay, his one-hour blood sugar went from 286 to 169. His, his two-hour blood sugar from 202 to 124. He had reversed his diabetes during his program. Let me show you. Let me show you the, the first uh, report that he did uh, over time his, from his baseline. So his fasting blood sugar is very high, okay, uh, uh, one hour blood sugar is almost 300. His fasting insulin, 20, sky high, should be ideally under five. Okay. Uh, and then his one hour insulin, very high at 53. So even though he was making a lot of insulin, there was no way that it, that even that amount of insulin was going to control his blood sugars. So John had both, both insulin resistance and pancreatic fatigue and, and a tendency to pancreatic failure. So let's keep going here. So um, over, a, over a period of, of, of time, you can see the, the dates here. His, look what happened to his blood sugars. He got to the point where his blood sugars were better than the average college students. Why? Because he kept on it. So he, basically, this is over a year's time. He completely reversed any, any tendency to even pre-diabetes, he reversed diabetes, pre-diabetes, and even his insulin resistance. Look at his fasting insulin here, from 20 to 3.5. His one-hour insulin, from this is the insulin that his own pancreas was producing and not even controlling his blood sugars, from 53 to 22. Look at his blood sugar, 119. Perfect. It's optimal. Okay, and his two-hour blood sugar, 87, compared to 202 at the beginning. So, so here's somebody in their 50s that put his mind to reversing his diabetes. And even though he struggled with obesity for many, 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 for decades, he was able to do it. Why? Because he finally believed that he could. He, he, he met up with enough doctors that told him that he could do it. And so he tried and he was successful in, in doing that. Well, here's a picture of John. Um, uh, uh, basically climbing half dome. Now, this is a guy who had such bad diabetic neuropathy that he barbecued his feet at the fire pit of Pismo Beach without even knowing it, okay, and, and almost ruined his opportunity to walk, and now he's able to climb half dome a year later. Okay, so, uh, so, um, so basically... Basically, uh, it can be done. Now, one of the reasons that a lot of doctors still say, well, you know, once a diabetic, always a diabetic, has to do with studies like this one what, that, what, that was published in Diabetes Care in 2014 that basically, basically showed that in a usual care, in other words, if you just uh, are given the standard medical care, right, that, that, that's considered to be the state-of-the-art medical care, and you're given that, guess what the risk, the chances of you reversing your diabetes? Not very good. So in this population of 122,000 eth ethnically diverse patients using usual care, this is what happened. Um, that, that basically only one, just over 1% had partial remission. That means they were able to get it down just into the pre-diabetic level. Okay. Uh, complete remission only occurred in 0.14% of their patients. That's, that's 1.4 out of 1,000 patients were able to get complete remission. 
would you would you follow your doctor's advice if they said, listen, if you just do what I say, there's a one chance in a thousand that you could reverse your diabetes? Of course you would. That would be ridiculous. Uh, and then prolonged remission, which means for at least five years, there was less than one chance out of 10,000 in the, in the standard of care group that were able to reverse their diabetes. In other words, uh, how you go about trying to do this makes all the difference in the world. Don't follow the standard of care here because that's not going to work as proven by these studies that are published. So, okay. So as we, as we prepare to take your questions, um, it's, it's important to understand the concept of exposome. In other words, if we ask the question, what is it that I need to do? What is it that I can do that actually potentially reverse my diabetes or prediabetes? Uh, and, and, and the answer to that question has to do with our exposome. These are, this is everything in our lives, as, 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 as depicted by this picture. Everything in our lives, every choice that we make, everything that we eat, everything that we do or, or don't do, everything that we, that we say, our emotional health, everything that we think, okay, Everything about our environment that we live in, that we choose, and how we interrelate one to another, that's our exposome. And those are the things that determine how our genes are, are expressed. Okay, 70% um, of, the, of the human population has at least one or two genes that promote diabetes. So you could say, well, you know, it's a 70% chance that I'm going to have diabetes, right? It's it's, it's just, it's genetic. I really can't do anything about a genetic risk, can I? Actually, that's not true. We can do everything about genetic risk. We can completely uh, undo the majority of our genetic risk by changing the expression of that gene through the choices of our exposome. Are, are we choosing to exercise? Uh, what uh, foods are we choosing to eat? Are we choosing to smoke, which dramatically increases the risk of diabetes, by the way? Are we, are we choosing to eat a diet that is loaded with the very nutrients that can help heal the pancreas, that can help heal the kidneys, that can help heal the heart and the brain? Uh, are, are we choosing to make better decisions about stress? Are we choosing to be more forgiving and more accepting of each other in our differences, right? Are, 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 we, uh, are we willing to get along with people that maybe in the past we didn't get along with? Those are choices that change our, the expression of our genes. We call that epigenetics, okay? And, and so in other words, genetics don't determine your future health. It's the expression of those genes, the epigenetics that determine that more than anything. So, um, as, as we're wrapping up this presentation, I, I want to I give you a couple kind of key tips about diet in particular. We talked about the importance of exercising after a meal. You know, I, what I would actually say here is that I would encourage you, if you have diabetes or prediabetes, uh, and you have your own blood sugar monitoring kit, which you should have if you have that condition, okay, check your blood sugars before, one hour after eating, and two hours after eating, whatever you normally like to eat. And, and that becomes your baseline. See how high your blood sugar goes one and two hours after the beginning of the meal based on what you normally eat. And then treat yourself. And when I say treat yourself, I mean splurge a little. Eat, eat things that you like, but you know are not necessarily good for you. Check to see how that then compares to your standard diet and how much higher your blood sugars go at one hour in two hours. And then start doing some light to moderate exercise immediately after eating and then check at one and two hours with the same type of meals and see the power uh, on how that changes your blood sugars after the meals. It's your after meal blood sugars that has the biggest impact on your hemoglobin A1C the next time you have that tested with your doctor, which is usually you know after 120 days or three or four months. Okay, so um, here's a rule, and, and I've seen this in my patients for decades. For every minute 
that you walk or do some similar type of movement exercise immediately after finishing your meal, you can lower your blood sugars anywhere from one point to three points. That's for every minute. Okay. And so if you got if you got some seriously high blood sugars and you've been checking after meal blood sugars, and you go like, oh, woe is me. What am I gonna do about this super high blood sugar? My blood sugars are running 300 or even higher after the meal. Well, if your blood sugars are running 300 after a meal, you could potentially, by walking for 30 minutes right after that meal, lower your blood sugars by almost 100 points just because of your walk. And then if you start paying attention to the dietary component, okay, and instead of eating third-class foods or second-class foods, concentrate on the first-class foods. First-class foods are the foods that generate first-class health. You know, these are the whole plant-based foods that – the green leafy vegetables, the, the colorful non-starchy vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. That's the beginning of the right dietary uh, uh, protocol. Uh, so, so you can dramatically improve your blood sugars, you know, and that gives you courage. If you could show that you drop your blood sugars 20, 30, 50, 70, 100 points just because you walk after the meal, that gives you courage to take the next steps and work on your diet and work on your sleep patterns and work on all the lifestyle things that influence your risk of, of so many, so many conditions. So, all right. So um, let me, let me end our, our discussion uh, uh, on, before we take questions on, on uh, one of my favorite slides from uh, Brenda Davis, who's my, my favorite dietitian in the world. She's from Canada. She's written over 10 books. She's, she's brilliant. She's the one that corrects all the doctors and all the researchers because she knows everything about this topic, okay? And, and but she's super sweet and, and, and engaging and humble. And she, she, she came up with this slide called the whole grain hierarchy. And so in other words, many of us are saying, well, oh, I ate whole grains. I don't know why my blood sugars are so high. Well, there is such a thing as a hierarchy of whole grains. So for instance, puffed whole grains like puffed wheat and puffed rice, uh, rice and puffed millet, that's whole grain, but that's all the way at the bottom of this hierarchy. In other words, that's the worst form of whole grain that you could eat. Okay. The next worst one is flaked whole grains like cold flaked cereal. A lot of people say, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's vegetarian, it's plant-based, you know, but my blood sugars are sky high. I guess that's just genetic. No, it's sky high because you're eating a refined whole grain that has been flaked, which means it quickly turns into sugar. And so that's not good. Okay. And so you see the hierarchy and you see the, the red line drawn in the sand, so to speak, by Brenda Davis, who says at minimum, you want to go into rolled whole grains like rolled oats or barley. Okay. Uh, broken whole grains like 12 grain cereal or bulgur. But what's best is the intact whole grains like camet berries or quinoa or brown rice, the, the barley, the oat groats, the entire, the entire uh, uh, a berry as opposed to a rolled or a flaked or, or, or a steel cut type, uh, type uh, grain. So, so pay attention to the hierarchy of whole grain and use that and control this by monitoring your blood sugar and saying, what is it that I can actually uh, 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 eat and still have reasonable blood sugar, right? All right, so so, the, so anyways, you wanna get a lot of good healthy foods. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna basically end with a couple, three slides. The Nornish, remember he said you got diabetes? Get rid of it. Develop a plan, work with somebody that can help you get rid of it. A simple cure is possible for essentially everyone with type 2 diabetes. And that's the end of, of the presentation. I will stop sharing screen now. And hopefully we can take some uh, good questions from our audience. You didn't interrupt me even once, Casey. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. There are some comments, but there are no questions specifically. But... I did think of some, oh, there was a question. There is a question right now. So I'll wait for my question and go into her question. So Francis Parker did say, we were given a wealth of information. So thank you for that. 
The question is, how can it be broken down and digested and incorporated into my life? Okay, all right. So you, you noticed that I, I, I told you a whole bunch of stories to help you believe, right? So sometimes people just want a list of things to do, but the average person is going to go like, well, I'm not going to do that list because I don't believe it. Okay, it, it, I don't have a basis for understanding or recognizing, you know, uh, why I should do that and how it compares to other things. So what I what I chose to do is help give you a perspective of what is possible. That whole historical perspective, diabetes in most cases is reversible. And at minimum, even if we don't reverse the diabetes, we reverse the complications of diabetes, which is really the, the big issue. Okay, so... The, the, what I emphasize, that if you kind of, so to answer your question directly here, the, there's two key things that I emphasize, okay? Uh, one of them, actually more than two, is blood sugar monitoring, okay? So the most important step is to start checking your blood sugars after meals. Hardly anybody with diabetes ever checks their blood sugars one hour or two hours after the beginning of a meal. Uh, that that's tragic because how are you going to know the impact of what you just ate if you don't check your blood sugars after the meal? You have no basis for determining whether that meal was good for you or not. You might have an idea, but you don't have the objective measure. And without the objective measure, you kind of go along doing whatever you normally did and wonder why you never get better. Okay. So number one is test yourself so that you can use that as a form of biofeedback to begin, uh, to begin to make better choices. So if you're testing your blood sugar one and two hours after the beginning of a meal, what I tell a lot of my patients, uh, get yourself a, a Freestyle Libra, that, that a, mon a, little, a little monitor that just hooks up to your, your shoulder and you can check your blood sugars with a wave of your phone. You can just go, oh, okay, uh, I dropped my blood sugar 40 points by going for a little walk. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I do that walk from now on. You know, if you just do the walk without checking, you go like, well, I feel better, but you don't really know the impact. When you know the impact, you're much more likely to persist in a behavior that's healthy for you so that you can, you can do it long enough to actually get the results of actually reversing the diabetes or pre-diabetes. So number one, check your blood sugars. Okay. And number two, um, do something about your blood sugars that you can monitor in real time immediately uh, before uh, uh, by checking. So when you walk uh, or do even just arm raises after a meal, you know, it can be any form of movement exercise for a period of time, even if it's just five minutes, that's a start, and then work up to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes or more. Every minute that you do that, you will lower your blood sugars compared to not doing it. And so, so that is a critical step. Uh, it's a very practical step. It, you know, like I said, you can lower, if your blood sugars are 300 at two hours after a meal, which I would, I would suggest is common, if not typical, in a type 2 diabetic. They're only checking their fasting blood sugars, and they're going like, well, I'm a little high, you know, maybe 150, 160. If your blood sugar is running 150, 160 before a meal, I guarantee you that many of you are going to be running above 300 after a meal. Okay, so that's right there, kind of a shocker. It wakes you up into saying, man, I got to do something about this. No wonder I'm, I'm not healthy. No wonder I'm at such high risk for heart attacks and strokes and dementia and amputations and, and nerve damage and kidney failure and going on dialysis. And, you know, those things are 100% preventable if we just pay attention to it. So, so, um, so we, we, we do the exercise, nothing hard, nothing gets sweaty. You can do it in your regular clothes, uh, light walking, get outside, do it inside, do it whatever, wherever it's convenient for you and see the difference, embrace the difference, and then continue to do that. So that's step, that's, that's the, after testing, do the exercise. Exercising makes us feel so much better about ourselves, especially when we see the impact then now we're going to feel even better about putting time and effort into our diet. You know, it's been said, uh, Casey, that, that it's easier to change somebody's religion than it is to change their diet. <laughs> and, 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 and people struggle with this. And so that's why you want to start feeling better first before you start 
you know, changing, changing your diet. And of course, there's a lot of resources available online, uh, professionals available, dietitians and nutritionists that can help guide you in making those decisions. There's, there's a great program available online that I actually helped develop a couple of years ago called Diabetes Undone. It's a it's an online course that you can take on, on your own by going to diabetesundone.com. Diabetesundone, all one word, dot com. And so uh, and so that that's something you can do in your own home. And of course, by doing that, you are doing the most important thing, the most important thing to to greatly limit your risk associated with COVID nineteen. Uh, to greatly limit your risk from even spreading it to other people. The most important thing you can do okay, is take care of your health and, and, and get your metabolic health under control. Because those, when you have metabolic imbalances, prediabetes, diabetes, that's what drives your risk for COVID and other infections and, and, and cancer and heart disease and strokes. That's the main driver. Okay. And so, so by paying attention to that, you can dramatically improve your health. So, so that, that's a step. And then and, and, and with regards to nutrition, I, I tried to give you a couple simple tips, and I'll give you one more. The, the, the simple tip was the, the whole grain hierarchy. Pay attention to the fact that just because something is whole grain doesn't mean it's good for you. Okay? In fact, most of the whole grain products are actually not good for people who have elevated blood sugars. They're just not. Why? How do you know? Check your blood sugar after you eat them. That's how you know. Uh, it's uh, and so so we, we need to become more cognizant of the impact of what we're eating on our after meal blood sugar, and that can help us make better and better decisions as we go forward. Uh, so so that's one nutrition tip. The other one is um, is what I call the three cube diet. I don't have a slide for it immediately right now, but. Uh, a three cube diet is is just a, I, I it, it's a, a a title I gave to a, a diet that is essentially concentrating on the foundation of lots of non starchy vegetables. Okay, now I'm not against starchy vegetables. I'm just saying the core that we begin with should be green leafy vegetables. You know, like at lunch eating a good salad, right? Uh, that has all kinds of different different greens in it that also has all kinds of colorful non-starchy vegetables like like purple cabbage uh uh brussels sprouts thinly sliced right T tomatoes uh uh bell peppers different colors you want color so so like three servings a day of greens that's why i call it three cube three times three three servings of of colorful vegetables. And by the way, on that, even blueberries would count. It's not a vegetable, but it's color, deep color. And then three servings of what we call the sulfur rich vegetables, like, like, like onions, mushrooms, uh, per, uh, cabbage, uh, the cruciferous family, uh, uh, and, and just in, incorporating those into our diet throughout the day dramatically improves your health, dramatically lessens the risk of developing dementia dramatically lessens the risk of, of a heart attack or a stroke. Those are simple things that we can do. Just add them to your diet as is. Um, the way one of the way that I do it, and I'll end with this tip uh, and take other questions, is is what I call the, the uh, do do breakfast stir fry. Believe it or not, my favorite part of breakfast now. I would never thought I would have done this, and I spent I spent years in Asia. Uh, working with people, and I noticed that they like to eat a lot of vegetables for breakfast and soups and, and different things. And you know, I thought it was kind of weird at first, and I tried to go, "Ah, it's actually pretty good." Uh, and so, one of the things that you can do to kind of kickstart your day is to include into your breakfast, not exclusively, but include as part of your breakfast a, a veggie stir fry, where you actually take um, um, uh, onions and mushrooms and thinly sliced Brussels sprouts or things like that and just stir fry them, right? You don't even have to use oil because there's, there's plenty of, of, of uh, hydration or water in those vegetables. You just stir fry them. You put a little Pam at the bottom of the pan, uh, spray that on and then just, just stir fry it and then add 
uh, add some uh, chopped up purple cabbage, uh, add some um, add some baby spinach. Okay, and then when that's all stir fried, you can add a couple slices of avocado. Oh my goodness, I can't wait for breakfast tomorrow. That's <laughs> that is a wonderful meal, and it's like a you know it's like a it's like a good good serving. It's it's, it's a lot of food. And I eat that with the rest of my breakfast. And now I have, I have many servings of, of greens and colorful vegetables already in my system with breakfast. And then at lunch, I have a salad uh, along with other foods and legumes and, and so forth. So, so those would be some tips that I would start with and recognize that the Diabetes Undone series has, has over has 40 videos that goes with it. And, and 10 of them are videos that I did with Brenda Davis, uh, this, this, this world, world uh, expert on nutrition, that, where we talk about how to do that as well. So those are, those are some tips for you. We do have another question, and it says, can peripheral neuropathy caused by diabetes be reversed with reversal of diabetes? Uh, okay, well, so I, I, I shared with you the case study of John McMahon. You know, he had peripheral uh, neuropathy from diabetes so bad. You know, you, you heard the story that that he didn't even know he he couldn't feel anything, and and he almost almost destroyed his feet because of it. And that's the problem. You know, pain is a blessing, and if you have pain, at least you're going to protect it, right? But if you have no pain because of neuropathy, you're in serious trouble. So what happens many times is that the, the, if you improve your blood sugars long enough, that they, the nerves actually grow back. They, 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 they heal. I've seen that dozens and dozens of times where they, they feel, they start feeling the pain coming back and then little by little the pain goes away, kind of in reverse of what happened initially and, and, the, and the nerves heal. And so absolutely, much of the time, diabetic neuropathy can be greatly improved, but don't wait until it's like, you know, uh, final stage neuropathy. If you have any early sign of neuropathy, that's the best time to reverse it. And there's, there's, uh, there's, there's not only the diet and exercise and the blood sugar control is important, but there's two, there's two key nutrients that are really important, actually three, that are really important to consider using if you have diabetes or diabetic neuropathy in particular. Uh, the first one is the, is the microalgae-based omega-3s, the EPA, DHA, uh, which, which is, by the way, where the fish get their fish oils, DHA, EPA, is from microalgae. So you just use some microalgae capsules to optimize your EPA, DHA, which has been documented multiple times to help help gradually reverse the damage associated with peripheral neuropathy and start healing the nerves. So that's one thing that you can do. Second thing is take alpha lipoic acid, okay, or R lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is, is a nutrient that you can take as a supplement, uh, getting about 300 milligrams once or twice a day. And studies have shown for decades now that that helps peripheral neuropathy. In fact, in many cases, it can actually cure peripheral neuropathy if caught early enough. So lipoic acid is very good. It's an antioxidant that's both fat and water soluble, and it helps protect the nerve against further damage. And little by little, if you're eating the right diet, if you get rid of the junk, if you're exercising after the meal, if you're getting your blood sugars under better control, the combination of everything that you do really helps speed healing potential. And then thirdly, uh, is vitamin B12. Really, really, I, I believe everybody should be supplementing vitamin B12 regardless of their diet. Okay, A lot of people say, well, that's only for vegetarians or vegans that aren't getting B12 in their diet. Well, there's more, there's more meat eaters and dairy consumers that have vitamin B12 deficiency than vegetarians. Why? Because there's a lot more meat eaters than vegetarians out there, right? Uh, so everybody needs B12. And one way to monitor whether you need more B12, not only check your blood levels, and you want your blood levels of B12 to be in the upper third of normal or even a little high, because that means you're, you're, you're getting a, a good amount of vitamin B12 that's protective. The second test to consider is homocysteine, 
a blood test that measures the amino acid of a little protein called homocysteine, which if elevated means that you're going to need more vitamin B12, you're going to need more folate, uh, you're going to need more vitamin B6, and that further lowers inflammation in your body when you lower that. So those would be the three tests that I would, any diabetic should be monitoring those three tests and many more in addition to their blood sugars and the hemoglobin A1C. There is another question in regards to berries. Is asked, will other berries work as well as blueberries? Okay, so, well, I'm a big fan of berries in general. You know, the, the dark berries uh, have have uh, unique levels of antioxidants and, and fl uh, flavino flavonoid compounds that are really good. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly fond of blueberries because there's so much good research. You're kind of like the king of the berry. Uh, but uh, using organic blueberries or wild uh, picked blueberries are really rich in, in antioxidants and other, other nutrients. Uh, so so I, I have some of those every morning myself, but certainly take advantage of other berries as well. You know, the, the uh, blackberries, boysenberries, uh, I mean, just really berries are healthy for you and, and they can be consumed. Now, you want to you want to balance it. You know, you don't want to eat a whole big tub of, of blueberries and wonder, well, why is my blood sugar higher today than it was other meals? Well, because you, you ate that out of balance. And so, so eat the berries, but, but check your blood sugars afterwards and find the right balance of different foods that come together to optimize your blood sugar. Okay, so I do not see any other questions for tonight. Okay. Some last moments if people want to ask some questions. <laughs> last chance. <laughs> yes. By the way, I, I, re I recently ran a group program uh, that with, it's called E4 Health, uh, E4 Diabetes Solutions, it's called. It's an online program. Uh, and this was a year and a half ago. And we, uh, actually two years ago now, and we had uh, about 20 people in the group. 67% of them in a period of four or five months were able to reverse their diabetes by following the, the fundamental principles that we just began discussing in, in this program. And so, and so it's not 1%, it's not one out of 10,000, like if people are just following the, the standard of medical care. I uh, remember taking medicines for diabetes is never gonna reverse diabetes. I'm, I'm not against the medicines, uh, they, they can be helpful to people that, depending on where they are in the course of the disease, but they're not addressing the underlying uh, cause of diabetes at all, okay? They, 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 they are just basically something to help manage your blood sugars temporarily until you actually address the, the causes of diabetes that we've been addressing today. Once you focus on addressing a cause, everything about our health gets better. We want to thank you again so much for doing this presentation. It was very informative. I'm sure we all learned something new and just inform us about how you can actually reverse diabetes. And that's a, like people were saying throughout the thing, throughout the presentation that this is, this is a great topic and this is like good information to know and just continue doing eating better, changing your lifestyle habits, always a good thing, no matter if you have chronic illnesses or whatnot, just living a healthy life. So always be the best option. Well, Casey, it's been a privilege uh, working with you tonight. And uh, I, hopefully many people will benefit from the time that we put together uh, on this on this program. And, uh, and I wish you great success as you go mm -hmm. on to get your PhD and, and, and serve the, the uh, juvenile population uh, in the pediatric uh, diabetes management. And so I'm sure I'm sure many people will benefit greatly by, by what you can do for them. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. God bless. Have a good evening. So I do want to go into our next presentation, not our next presentation, but what will come 
next, as you can see on the flyer here, April 22nd at 7 p.m. You will be hearing from Dr. Finnison as well as Dr. Youngberg again on preventing Alzheimer's and rever reversing cognitive decline. So be in tune for that next presentation. So I'm gonna close out with prayer and yeah, have a great night. So thank you. Sorry, I had to close your eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for bringing us all here and sitting through this presentation, this wonderful, insightful presentation that Dr. Youngberg gave us tonight. Please help us use these, these new found skills and information that he's given us to go throughout our daily lives to live a healthy and better life and just apply the, the skills that he's given us. Um, please let us continue living healthy through these COVID times and just be with us through anything we do. Thank you, Amen. Amen.